I'm, I'm going to ask the next panel to just join me on stage rather than introdu introducing them so we can get straight into the discussion. Um, I'll briefly outline the context for conversation around what we're calling the Great Acceleration. And that's taking that revolution driven by those pioneers that we've just talked with, um, with Sadiq, into how do we get that into the market? How do we get that driven towards as many patients as possible and as many geographies as possible and as many socioeconomic strata as possible so that we can really drive access to, to medicines um, uh, universally? My name is Conor McKechnie. I lead strategy and marketing for Cytiva, one of the Danaher life science companies. And as we've seen this morning, and as Sid so eloquently showed us, the future of genomic medicine is it's as diverse as it is complex as it is being proven to be revolutionary. And we've seen, however, in the last three years that we can actually do this. We can actually go really fast as a community when, when we need to. So we're going to ask in this panel, what is it that we need to do to take on what we've learned in the last three years and in the 10, 15, 20, 25 years that have led up to that to take these innovations through the processes that they need to go through so that they can reach those patients. Um, as we know, the, the future is actually here. It's just not well distributed, if I can misquote William Gibson. Um, and it's not as affordable as, as we'd like it to be. So we know it can only be through collaboration um, amongst all the players, that those that are driving the science, those that are driving the engineering, uh, those that are driving clinical practice, and, and those that are driving the, the regulatory frameworks that we all work and, and live within. So we're going to look at you know, how do we drive, uh, as we heard from Sid and others, how do we drive the cost out of manufacturing? How do we drive speed in approval? Um, it seems to be as much a people problem as a technology problem. And there's obviously a lot of that for us to get into. So, oh yes, we have one person joining us virtually, so there will be a large face on the screen at some point. Um, we have uh, uh, illness taking its, its toll. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with, with you, Sonia, because it's very important very often in these cases to start with the why. And the why is the patient. So give us a little bit of an insight into the work that you're doing at MassGen and at the Broad, because your story is really amazing. Um, you've got a really personal motivation, as I think many people have in this space, um, for, for driving the work that you do. So let's start with Sure. Um, well, thank you for having me and for that question. I, I do want to start by recognizing that I'm not the only person in this room with a patient experience. I wear it on my sleeve, but I think we've all been there. We all are there, and we are, all will be there. But um, my, my particular path is that um, I was actually trained as a lawyer. My husband, Eric, was trained as a transportation engineer. Uh, this was now a lifetime ago. And um, in 2010, we went through the experience together of losing my mom to a catastrophic, rapid neurological decline that we had no name for while she was alive. And only after she passed, we learned she died of genetic prion disease. And in that word, genetic, was our first clue that this wasn't a tragic chapter in my family's life that had closed. This was the ongoing story about my 50-50 risk and what to do about it, um, which, for whatever reason, for us was instantly clear. We got predictive genetic testing. We needed to know. I did inherit the mutation from my mom. and. Um, to make a long story short, although I promise not a single day of it has been boring, we uh, left our old careers and retrained in biomedicine and now run a lab together at the Broad Institute um, devoted to developing uh, therapy for prion disease in our lifetimes. I'll say a couple things about where we're at. Um, it's genetically such a nice clean story. Single gene, single RNA, single protein, knock it down, you protect the animals, which in our case are beautiful models that actually get the disease. Therapeutic hypothesis, I will say, is in place. And do the tools exist here on Earth to get that work done? I, I think yes. With a nod to um, Feng Zhang's you know, beautiful remarks about delivery, because we are a whole brain disease and we need to get to all those neurons, and that is it's tricky. But I do think we have some molecular machines here on Earth that could do this job. 
And we're at this very interesting point where I think we're transitioning from our battle being largely on the field of molecules to our greatest jeopardy lying on the field of human systems. And this is tough. This is a challenge I didn't anticipate because we got, when we got into this, we said to each other and to ourselves, the disease biology may be unfathomably complex. It may be something that we can't defeat in our lifetimes. Now I see other opponents, and what's tragic to me is that they are opponents that do not mean to be our opponents. I promise you, I like everyone I've met while I've been doing this work. I like every FDA scientist I've talked to, every industry scientist I've talked to, every academic. None of these people have anything but the best intentions. Um, and yet, I think there's a way in which institutions struggle to be the sum of their individuals. And when I look at the sort of scripts that we default to, um, that's where I see a lot of the sort of the, the, the drag and delay, the sort of um, defaulting to precedent, even though it's unworthy of our vision of the future, right? I, I look at the sort of interactions between our industry collaborators and FDA scientists, and every individual in their heart wants to be moving faster and in a different way. So one of my big questions as I look forward is, how can we enable people to rise to those ambitions and sort of rise above their role and what they think is prescribed to them and what they think is their um, sort of limited, limited scope to make change? Because here's the strange thing about our quest. 10 or 20 years ago, we would have said our prayers and made our peace, right? We would not have changed careers. There wasn't enough hope on the horizon. 10 or 20 years from now, I'm hoping, and join me in this hope, that this is a moot conversation because the disease is treatable. We just so happen to be right here at the knife's edge of what may be possible in my lifetime and for the people in my community who have become not just my friends, but my family. For these individual people, can we do it? Can we do it in time? So, so the science is really clear. We know what you need to do to actually get it through into therapeutic practice. So you're, you're, you're working against the homeostasis of the system, as it were, right? Yes. Um, uh, Dr. Mitchell Feiner, the CEO of Elevate Bio, um, and a remarkable career, um, innovation startups like Bluebird. Um, tell us a little bit then about how we address this sort of homeostasis of the system, if you want to call it that, such that we can move, move things forward. Right, so the homeostasis of the system, this is a really good point, and it's a point that I've seen evolve over my career since the mid-80s of starting into pharmaceutical development with, uh, let's call it an unconventional food group, that's cell gene therapy and regenerative medicine, uh, because the system is built on uh, first small molecules, very well-defined systems, uh, very easy to uh, characterize and uh, very easy to characterize in cell-free systems in animals. And then, of course, we went to the next level of complexity of monoclonal, animals, uh, monoclonal antibodies and biologics. And here now we enter the realm of cell, uh, either engineered or non-engineered cells, uh, gene delivery based vectors, some using uh, proteins that are native and we're simpler, simply doing protein replacement and some using engineered proteins that do not exist in nature. So we're continuously uh, improving or uh, building on the complexity. You know, and I was reminded about a story in 1997 when Luigi Naldini and I went to the FDA and we said, uh, we want to deliver genes to post-mitotic cells using an engineered HIV-1 virus. And, you know, they saw the briefing packet in advance, but you could see <laughs> the, the eyes widen. And the answer was, do tell. And we proceeded to tell a story of these were what we thought the best analytics 
that we could think of of the day to show that we could build actually a safe delivery system and that uh, it's an efficacious delivery system and it would meet the criteria and we could establish a, 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 a system of testing and that launched an ongoing dialogue uh, and that led to several clinical trials 10 years later. And of course, these therapies uh, are, are now approved, whether it's in the CAR T uh, therapeutics uh, that uh, have been recently developed. There's now uh, roughly half a dozen, or the engineered hematopoietic stem cell therapies that my colleagues and I, uh, and then others have developed and gotten approved in uh, using uh, lentivirus-based vectors. But again, it's really working as closely with the regulators and they will accept the science-based discussion no matter how complex the science is. Mm -hmm. Your science just has to be rigorous. And for me, um, really being a, the educator and leading them along the way uh, and the businesses that I've built over the last uh, 35 years culminating in what we now have it Elevate really uh, espouses that philosophy. And I think the crux comes down to uh, the, the composition of the product, the manufacturing of the product, what we call large-scale biology. It's taking this small-scale laboratory phenomena and having a powerful enough suite of analytics mm. that show both safety and efficacy as we go from discovery to preclinical to phase one, two, to late stage and commercial. And we've defined the critical quality attributes of those products ahead of the mm. curve, mm. and we maintain those. And I think uh, by showing that to regulators, you know, we've made good progress mm. with what I'd call our, our, you know, quite a bit of fairly complex mm. products. Mm. So, so that's actually f fascinating, and it's a really good point to bring in um, Dr. Katie Rezvani, who's joining us uh, re remotely from MD Anderson. Um, Katie, you're f fully devoted to NK cell, uh, natural killer cells in, in your research. Um, could you comment a little bit on, on what you do, and then maybe um, riff off what Mitchell was saying here. Sorry, I'm looking at Katie here on the comfort screen, so if it looks like I'm looking weirdly down, that, that's why. Um, and, and talk a little bit about whether or not we think enough about what M Mitchell just described um, in, the, in the early stages of, of research, and then as we move into the translational stages, about how that sort of flow of analytics is going to come through from uh, research right the way through to process development, manufacturing, and, and, and so on, with the approval steps that are, are needed. But, but your, your work first, and then perhaps a comment. Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm very sorry I can't be there in person. I would have loved to be there, but I don't think my fellow panelists would have appreciated getting my bug that's really been there for about a week. I've totally lost my voice, so I hope you can hear me. Um, so um, my, the focus of my lab really is, is as, as Doug mentioned, is on uh, natural killer cells and looking at strategies to engineer uh, cord blood derived NK cells to target um, um, cancer. Uh, our first study was in the setting of um, uh, patients with lymphoid malignancies where we demonstrated, sorry about that, hang on, there's my dog. Uh, we demonstrated that cord blood derived NK cells can be successfully um, engineered to express a chimeric antigen receptor and also to secrete a cytokine into leukemia 15. And in the first in human study, we demonstrated the safety of this approach and also we demonstrated um, a very encouraging initial um, uh, responses that then led to a partnership with uh, Takeda. And we have since now taken this approach to targeting other types of cancer. As it happens, we've now started a new clinical trial where, again, we've um, uh, engineered our NK cells to express a car 
targeting uh, CD70 and it's a, it's a basket run in hematologic malignancies. Uh, the first patient has just been dosed with a second basket trial in uh, solid tumors targeting renal cell carcinoma or subsarcoma and mesothelioma. We also have started looking at strategies to um, protect our NK cells from the impact of the tumor microenvironment using CRISPR gene editing to knock out um, um, genes in NK cells that make them susceptible to uh, TGF beta, but also to iatrogenic immunosuppression such as corticosteroids. And in a clinical trial with our uh, multiplex CRISPR gene edited, um, and case health and glioblastoma has just received FDA approval. So my lab focuses very much on a discovery, um, trying to understand mechanisms of um, immune escape, understanding, of course, in case of biology, and using this knowledge then to use those incredible tools that are now um, available to us, such as car engineering, CRISPR gene editing, et cetera, to make the next generation products. Excuse me. Bless you. I also, um, thank you, um, lead our cell engineering group in the GMP facility. I co-lead our GMP lab with my friend and colleague, Dr. E.J. Schmal, where we are um, taking a lot of the work that uh, we we do preclinically in the research lab and translate it to the clinic, manufacture the products in our GMP facility at MD Anderson, um, and then also collaborate very closely with my colleagues at MD Anderson and my clinical colleagues to run the clinical trials. So I think at MD Anderson, we're very fortunate in that, you know, we have the research lab we have the incredible core facilities that allows us to do single cell omics analysis. We can do the mechanistic studies. We have access to a GMP facility and also access to patients. And then we also have access to the um, uh, blood samples and biopsy samples from those patients that then allows us to go from bed back to bench side to very um, um, in a sophisticated um, correlative science to understand mechanisms of failure or response, and then that way engineer the next generation of um, of, uh, of cell products. Uh, going back to what my fellow panelists had mentioned, you know, a lot of the um, um, limitations, a lot of the bottlenecks that are also valid in the setting of these the early phase trials, which is what we are focusing on. Um, we have, uh, uh, you know, there, there are limitations in terms of access to GMP grade material. Obviously, the cost of manufacturing is, um, is, 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 is sometimes very prohibitive, especially for uh, the academic setting where our funding will come from. Uh, from grants and many uh, grant-giving bodies, such as um, NIH, of course, they they fund uh, innovative studies, but uh, manufacturing of a cell product is, is beyond their capability of uh, of funding and supporting. Um, we have very good um, discussions and collaborations with FDA, and I can tell you, getting our CRISPR gene edited in case our product for glioblastoma approved was... Uh, was a, was a long journey, and we really had to work very closely with our FDA colleagues. Um, it was very painful at times, for lack of a better word, but what I can say is it made our product safer uh, for our patients. So for that, I'm very grateful for the expertise of FDA and their generosity in working with us. S superb, Katie, and, and thank you for soldiering through and um, reminding us of all the other things that we've learned through the pandemic about virtual presence and, and, and so on. Um, you, you mentioned the manufacturing uh, process. M maybe this is the right time to bring in Eliana Clark, Dr. Eliana Clark, the CTO of Intellia. I mean, you've been leading manufacturing and biologics operations for years and years and years. Y you know how this works when it works well. Um, we want to drive yield. We want to drive reproducibility. We want to drive quality. Um, it's different 
um, in these new complex therapeutic modalities. So what do researchers and, and therapy developers need to be thinking about really early on such that when we do go into process development and manufacturing, um, that it goes as smoothly as possible? Yeah, good morning, everyone, and thank you for that question. Um, indeed, as you mentioned, I, I spent uh, most of my career in manufacturing operations and uh, a significant part of it in the biologic space, in recombinant proteins, monoclonal antibodies, I think we talked about that, uh, mm. I call it here. And, uh, and, and I learned uh, from there uh, some big lessons. I, if, if we were talking earlier about uh, how um, the yields improved significantly uh, in, in the previous panel uh, in monoclonal antibody production, et cetera, that lowered the cost of goods and made them, these drugs more available. Uh, what we learned from there is if I take two, uh, and the reason I mention it is because it's going to be relevant to the conversation about, about ad advanced ther therapies. There were two things that play a key role in there. One was uh, platform technologies and developing those platforms, both from a manufacturing point of view from, and also from an analytical point of view. Um, obviously, there was a lot of work, and in, in, as we understood the biology more, we were able to improve those yields, et cetera, but there was, you know, engineering, but there was those platforms that really made the difference in, in, in advancing the drugs. I think Phil mentioned earlier, the first drug at Allen Island took 16 years, the second one took one year, because you build that platform. So pla building platforms is very important. And the other one is collaboration, and it's a collaboration between the uh, in innovators, uh, the contract manufacturing uh, and development organizations, the suppliers of the equipment and the raw materials, and the regulatory agencies. And those collaborations, and you know, they, they're usually pre-competitive through some kind of consortia, or they happen through publications and conferences, move the needle and keep moving things up and moving them forward, and allow to establish frameworks in, in best practices, and then we all learn from there. So that's what I took from all those years. Coming into Intelia in the advanced therapy space, uh, what was key for us is the platform. So we do have a modular uh, editing platform approach. We, we can edit both in vivo and ex vivo. We use our delivery technologies based on lipid nanoparticles, and we use it for both in vivo and ex vivo. So these are scientific technological platforms. And then again, we can, we can correct, you know, uh, uh, deactivate a, a, a disease-causing gene or insert a gene. We can make allogeneic cells, et cetera, with that technology. But when I look at it from the manufacturing, what we need to do from a manufacturing point of view, I look at the components of that. You know, this platform, so what do we need to deliver CRISPR technology with this messenger RNA? We need the long oligonucleotides for the GAR RNAs. We, we need lipid nanoparticles. We need AAV when we insert a gene. We need you know, cell engineering if you're going to do um, ex vivo cell therapy. Those are manufacturing platforms. Mm -hmm. And so when we work with our colleagues in research, we, start, we, we tightly collaborate. So my organization, Technical Development, is very much uh, in, in partnership with our research colleagues. And we start looking at manufacturability early on, actually at the criteria for us to nominate a development candidate includes the manufacturability. That ability to actually put it in the platform, or if we need to develop a new platform, we start working early on. And I think that's what helps make that transition and, and, and make those processes more robust. We also work a lot in the analytics, because in this space you need really strong analytical tools. But I want to end, because I know I took a lot of time. I think we also need to collaborate more um, in our, to advance um, this field. And that pre-competitive collaboration is going to be very important. Mm -hmm. uh, that will allow us to ultimately you know, collaborate with a company like Danaher to another suppliers of equipment and materials. Because as, you, as it was mentioned earlier, the, some of the costs are very high. The cost of consumables and raw materials is very high. The cost of manufacturing is very high. And so that collaboration will allow us to improve yields so that will lower the cost. But also we need to invest in the other aspects of the manufacturing, like mm. X mentioned, raw materials, consumables, et cetera. Thanks very much, Eliana. And, and Doug Ingram, you're currently you know, CEO of Sarepta, um, looking at primarily rare diseases. A lot of what you've done in, in the last few years is of course, driven through partnerships. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about how that pays dividends and whether or not that's also a way to help sort of drive um, drive the total cost of bringing the therapeutic out um, onto the market, uh, drive it down? Yes. Th first of all, thank you very much for having me here. I would say I'm honored to be on this panel, but I'm actually a little intimidated, to be honest, between this panel and the prior one. Um, it's really an impressive group of people and amazing science. And in fact, let me to explain a little bit about the perspective that we at least at Sarepta have on the concept of partnering maybe requires me to explain a little bit about what we're trying to do at Sarepta. And in a very real sense, Sonia's story is our problem statement that kind of drives us. How do we take this unbelievable science and innovation that has occurred over literally decades now and translate it to therapies that can actually help patients, in our case, rare disease patients and children, not at some future distant moment in time, some vanishing point, but right now or as close to now as possible, which is, which is difficult, and our partnering approach um, plays a role in that. So just for those who don't know, Sarepta is a genetic medicine company. We have multiple modalities and multiple therapeutic areas. We're gene therapy, we're RNA through oligos, and we're um, gene editing as well, and we focus on neuromuscular uh, neurology um, and, and cardiomyopathies right now, and I'm sure we'll go beyond that as we get success. We do have three approved therapies, and we have a gene therapy right now that I'm very excited about. We're in the review process right now, and if it launches, it's for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and in vivo gene therapy. It would be the most significant thing that's um, happened in the treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and I think it would be a bellwether, in my view, for the ability to move fast and bring these therapies forward. So, to your very good point, we've been a big partner over the last, I've been at the company five and a half years, we've partnered um, a number of times, I think I've probably done over 50 transactions, and it really gets to this issue. So from our perspective, why do I mention all of that as a predicate to partnership? Because to try to move things fast, you have to be tenacious, you have to be impatient, but I think you also have to be humble. I mean, think about all of the different ways in which we have to um, innovate to actually bring therapies forward. Everything from the way we manufacture to yields in manufacture to delivery mechanisms and the like. And we have brilliant scientists, in my um, non-humble um, opinion, at Sarepta. But if we envisioned that we were going to do it all ourselves, I think we would be, well, we certainly wouldn't have a gene therapy right now about ready to launch um, if we're successful. So that's been our partnering approach. It's essentially to try to the fullest extent possible, in addition to building um, the science internally to be um, non-arrogant and to, to partner with the best and brightest. We've spent an enormous amount of time partnering with academics because one of the things we found in this nascent field of translation of gene uh, genetic medicine to therapies is that so much of the advancement in, and, um, and knowledge base and talent exists not yet in the you know, commercial organizations or biotech organizations, but are actually in academia. Mm -hmm. um, and we've even gone so far as to, to partner. So for instance, in our gene therapy, we've decided that we're going to partner outside of the US with a large organization, Roche, because looking inward, we realized if in fact our goal is to take, to take this science, translate it, and treat as many patients as possible, um, how would we do this fast enough outside the United States? And it was, it was clear to us that, that there were those that could do it better than us. So from my perspective at least, in addition to talking about how, we, how do we in fact practically translate um, all of this science to something that actually is meaningful to a patient today, I think we need to think about how we can collaborate, to your very good point, um, as we um, not only take the therapies that we're working on right now and, and bring them um, to patients in the United States and around the world, and a, around the world's a tough one right now, mm. which we should talk about, because you know, I think that's going to require a lot of advancement to mm. get some of this genetic medicine to places like Africa and India and other places mm. that will require step order changes in the way we approach things. Mm. But I think we have to collaborate and do this in a really... Um, in a, in a really partnered way, or we're going to find ourselves not as far along as we might otherwise be in five or eight years. So, so, so foundational to, to good collaborations is, is understanding amongst the collaboration partners. So can, can we dig into that for a little bit? Um, you, you know, the understanding um, that's required 
uh, on the academic side, and um, uh, I, I'm going to come to you, to you Mitchell, uh, with this. The understanding that's required on the academic side of what's going on in uh, what happens in industry and, and how industrial partners then take things forward. And then the, the, the reverse side of that, which is the understanding on the industrial side of, of, of partners, of how things work in academia and in, in translation. Do we do enough on that sort of human problem side of things as um, I think it was Edison in, in, on the previous panel described it, to help build the knowledge on, on, on both sides and then if you add the regulators on, on all three sides of what actually needs to happen to, to move things forward. Do we do enough understanding across those groups? Right, I mean it's tough because if you look at the diversity across academic institutions, there are some institutions that are very engaged and open mm. in partnering and then there are some uh, academic institutions that are a little more, uh, if, if you will, uh, uh, less engaged and, and, and more rigid. You know, at Elevate, partnership is the, the basis of what we do, whether it's partnership in manufacturing, partnership in drug development, or partnership in company creation. And so, you know, w we've had the experience now of partnering across uh, with venture investors, with academic institutions, and with biotech companies, and mixing it all up to create some unique collaborations and partnerships with what we bring and with what all the partners bring, because nobody has the ideal solution. And so we are, uh, by nature of the way we've created the company, been very partner-centric, and, and that's really worked out. And when you have multiple people at the table, you know, those that are a little more, let's call them rigid, mm. they see how the other co-partners, you know, it takes a village, uh, they see how the others are interacting, and we actually get some traction. And mm. so I think uh, as we see the complexity of cell gene therapy and regenerative medicine products growing, uh, no one can... Uh, do it themselves, and it will need multiple partners. Mm. And we've seen this getting uh, easier and easier as we build uh, bridges and mm. multi-component products with mm. all these different institutions. Mm. 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 So, Sonia, how have you seen the, sort of that, that play out? Because you're coming at it from a slightly different angle in that it's quite simple. You, I mean, it's not simple, but it's simpler, your science in the sense of, of what happens in, in vivo. And so the, the partnering with the various organizations that you need to work with to drive things forward, ha, has that been easy? Has, have you had to do a lot of learning and teaching both ways? How has that worked? All of the above. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I would say is that, if not simple, we know enough, I think, and hope about the disease biology to be able to go after it in a meaningful way. Um, but I will say that our mission has changed before our eyes compared to 10 or 12 years ago when we were getting into this. And we thought that our job, perhaps our only job, was going to be to discover the molecule. Hmm. And in fact, as we've matured but also been mentored, for which I'm incredibly grateful, we've come to see that our mission is both larger than that and, and if anything, discovering the molecule is the piece that we are least suited to do. And so our lab does now the genetics of prion disease and, and genomics and natural history and biomarker development. We've done the sort of mouse model and assay development. We've done um, the sort of regulatory engagement with FDA. We've become vertically integrated, I think to an unusual degree. We launched a patient registry. It, it, we've really just been dr sort of drawn forward by the thread of just what needs to get done mm. and what all needs to be on the platter for people to look at prion disease, which, by the way, isn't as rare as you think. It kills one in 6,000 people, and say, this disease is developable. Mm. And therefore, we, biotech, pharma, with a particular molecular machine that we specialize in, <coughs> would like to partner with you to connect all these dots using all these tools that you've assembled. Mm. It's so far, so we've been collaborating with Ionis Pharma for six years now. A first human may be dosed with a prion protein lowering ASO within the next year. Um, 
that's the model that we've followed. Um, I think it has been, um, you know, s successful. It's also just taught us a ton about what it means to work closely with, um, with, with an entity that at first we were sort of leading by the nose and saying, here's the preclinical data we're developing in our lab at our own pace, and isn't it exciting? And now, as we near the clinic, they are taking the lead. And in some ways, that's very painful. In some ways, we're giving up our, um, you know, the, the sort of driver's seat and seeing that other people's risk preferences, you know, sit in a different place than ours. Um, our first ever interaction with FDA was a critical path innovation meeting where my husband and I went down as patient scientists and sat in the room and achieved a level, I think, of like buy-in and open dialogue that amazed me. It's not what I'd been led to expect. The next time we went back, we were sitting in the room with our industry partners, and um, I think I don't need to convince you that the dynamic was different. Mm. Um, so seeing the way in which bringing all these partners in is both essential, but also drags us back towards the boxes that everybody thinks they're constrained to, right? And we, I think, just because of the unique life circumstances we've been dealt, are the people who feel entitled to like jump out of our box as patients or academics or like whatever other boxes we have because we just need to move this as fast as we can, right? Um, how to keep that in the picture, how to keep that dynamic at the helm while interfacing with all of these existing institutional dynamics is, I think, our big challenge. Superb. Let, let, let's move for a minute. Thank you for that. Let, let's move for a minute to, to, to something that's been described a, a, a number of times this morning, um, the reduction of the total cost of manufacturing. Um, Eliana, key strategies there. What, what is it that we need to think about at the various points in, in the journey to help drive that cost out? Because it can't just all be about less expensive technology because there's people in there, there's processes in there, there's complexity in there. Yeah, it's a, it's a multi, it's a multi-factor. Is it on? Yep. Yeah. It's a multi-factor thing. Uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that we, uh, we tightly collaborate with our research colleagues. And one of the things that we always strive for in the manufacturing space is for simplicity versus mm -hmm. complexity. And the question, you know, the, the science, what you can do with CRISPR uh, uh, technology is incredible. The potential is enormous. And we can develop these really sophisticated um, editing technologies and tools that are then become difficult to implement in a manufacturing environment. And so part of the conversation and the dialogue with our colleagues in research is how do we simplify how do we develop something, again, I mentioned earlier, that is manufacturable? And it starts in there versus having a very, very complex process to say, do we simplify? What are the steps, what are the critical steps that we need to take? And how can we get this done uh, in a more efficient, faster way? And then looking, you know, from a process development point of view, we look at um, efficiencies, you know, reducing the cost of manufacturing starts from like raw materials, you know, doing optimization studies. Some raw materials that we use in our technology are very expensive. So are we actually operating and when we first start up, you know, a phase one clinical program, we may not have the best process developed. Are we operating in the right space that gives us the output and the yield that we need, but it's not consuming an enormous amount of raw material? That's one of the big questions mm -hmm. that we ask and then try to optimize around there. We've been able to lower the, the cost on, in some of our platforms significantly by looking at that. You know, looking at that, what we call the design space, and seeing where some, some of those, uh, where we can move the process to a place that gives us the quality, the critical quality attributes that we were talking earlier, but it's allowing us to, to utilize less, from, lower, you know, less amounts of raw materials. Mm -hmm. Consumables is another one, and again, we look at, you know, those, in, those are also part of the cost of manufacturing. Manual operations, you see it in the cell therapy space. Manual operations are costly because you need people to do manual operations. They're open operations. Then some of those, you need to have a very high degree of classification. You know, for those of you that don't work in manufacturing, you see those personnel in the bunny suits, right? 
That is a very costly manufacturing. How do we close the system? How do we automate them? So to, again, reduce the, the, that cost of manufacture. These are all the questions that we uh, constantly ask, and I'm sure you relate to this. We are constantly asking to make sure that the, that cost is significantly decreased. You know, in the cell therapy space, we moved away from, you know, we work on T cells, we moved away from autologous manufacturing to allogeneic. Mm -hmm. um, it allows us to make many doses with one batch. It allows us to control the process better. We have a lot less variability in the process. That's one of the challenges with autologous cell therapy manufacturing. So again, these are all advances that help us with that, reducing that cost. That needs to go down even further. See, I love what he spoke about, being able to get to uh, manufacture a dose of an autologous product at $20,000 or $30,000. It's for an autologous product, it's unheard of. So I, I can't wait to go and see this facility or take a video tour of it. Uh, but that's what we need to strive for, you know, automation, data systems, it was mentioned earlier. All of those things contribute it, to that. It's very interesting because this is really clearly a different paradigm, and, and you, you alluded to this, Doug, is that there's a different paradigm here in the global north with respect to what drives costs, and then in the global south with what can actually bring the cost down. Because it sounds like an open system, in Sid's case, is what's enabled them to drive the cost out. But were you to do that in the global north, you'd be driving additional cost. So we need to think differently about the actual, you know, the socioeconomic and technology environments where these therapies are going to be delivered to, to drive those solutions. And it's, it's not just, can I argue, this, this idea of having to grandly reduce costs is, is not just geographic, although it is geographic as well. There will be, if we don't fix this, there will be a time when genetic medicine will be available to certain countries and regions of the world and not others, and I don't think anybody here would, would disagree that that would be tragic. It, it also will happen here, which is there are ultra-rare diseases that will never be viable unless we can get those costs down. Now, I would argue in addition to, and, and that's gonna take step order change and innovation. That's real innovation. I would also argue that what we also need is approvals, that we actually need experience, you know, and that using a aphorism that's, you know, worn out, you know, we, sh we can't make perfect the enemy of the good in the interim period. If, you know, the Wright brothers hadn't, no one would like the, no one would fly on a Wright brothers plane today. But if we didn't have the Wright Brothers plane, we wouldn't have the next innovation, we wouldn't have jets, and we wouldn't have, you know, A380s today. So I think this idea of getting experience, you know, turning the crank is part of this. That alone won't get us where we need to go. But it does get to this point that we kind of, after all this unbelievable science, this, I'm going to go back to what I said at the beginning, we kind of got to get on with it. And we've got to get some approvals, and we've got to start treating patients, and we've got to get experience together. Mm. And then we've got, to com we've got to collaborate, but we also have got to compete, because competition is wonderful as well, frankly. Mm. You, know, you know, one of the exciting things about one of our, our RNA therapies that got approved six years ago, it has spawned maybe the, you know, one of the most aggressive competitive races. Over 30 companies are focusing on Duchenne because of that approval. That's, you know a personal pain in the neck, but it's a wonderful right, thing for Duchenne patients, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's absolutely wonderful, and that's what we need more and more of, which means we need, we need to translate all this amazing science to therapies. Superb, Doug, thank you. So look, we're coming up on time. I'm gonna do, do like a last quick fire question, right? So, um, Katie, I'm gonna come to you. What excites you most um, in the therapeutic space right now? What, like, in a very short sentence, what's most exciting for you? I think CRISPR gene editor cell therapies are going to be the future of medicine. I really do believe that. Okay, I'd love to say you heard it, heard it here first, but, but I think a lot of people are saying that. It's fantastic. Also very excited about it. Um, Mitchell, what, what's really exciting for you um, in, in being able to broaden access? Right, right. Oh, to broaden access, you know, automation. Uh, Automation. You need a, you need a mic. Automation, okay. automation, and I wish automation. I'd automated that. I didn't automate that. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I, I, you know, the the speed at what we're bringing automation into our R and D process mm -hmm. and into our manufacturing process. The idea that if you had a device the size of a microwave oven and you had a room full of these, you can, and a robot, you could crunch through more and more cell therapy mm -hmm. products faster 
Uh, there are groups that have these in trailers. You can ship them anywhere. Yep. And so that is what's going to democratize cell therapy, not only to the first world, uh, just the automation of the production and the automation of the assays. Superb, fantastic. Um, Eliana, what, what really excites you? Uh, the, it, with advanced technologies and what we are doing today is that uh, curative potential. Mm. You know, I, all my career I've worked on disease modifying therapies and that potential to cure that to we cure. have today, yeah. it's incredible. You know, yeah. think about going to the doctor tomorrow, you know, some years on the road and you get diagnosed with some genetic disease and the doctor said, oh, by the way, I have a vial in the freezer here that I can give you right now or you can come a month from now and you forget about that disease. I mean, that's my dream. It's incredible potential. Yeah. So, Sonia, it's deeply personal for you, um, aside from the progress that you're making, what's really the most exciting thing? Well, I, I'll tell you about an exciting new idea that I'm percolating on. I have to admit that I think less about cost of manufacturing of drug products than many people on this panel and in this room, but just listening to Sid's remarks and some of the remarks here this morning, I'm now percolating on the ways in which driving down costs is not just enabling for drug access around the world, which is obviously extremely important, but will, I hope, enable us to push the ball on when we treat people, when we have therapies that could make a difference, because when we treat is so determinant of the mm. amount of good and the kind of good we can do. I think prion disease is one very clear example, but we're not alone. So much, much earlier treatment. Much, much exactly. earlier. So there's this Super. other dimension, temporal accessibility, that I think for all of these genetically informed therapies, we're gonna have this ability to go upstream of somebody being in catastrophic health decline. Mm. Stabilizing someone in catastrophic decline, <clears throat> it would be an improvement, yeah. I think, in some cases, over what we can do today, but it's not my goal for myself. It's not my goal for my community. Superb. Doug, the last word. Yeah. Um, what excites me is also the thing that makes me nervous, which is I think we are on the precipice of a potential revolution in genetic medicine. But I, the, what makes me nervous about it is I don't think it's an inevitability. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to, I think there's a fragility to, to innovation. And the, the, when you listen to the panelists, listen to the last group of panelists, listen to this amazing science that has gone on, the, 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 we have to shift the paradigm. Mm. So for instance, the regulatory science and the development science has to start trying to match the innovation that the basic science is bringing to us. Mm. And we have some of the tools already and we ought to challenge ourselves to use them more and to, and to come up with new ones. And there are things like, with genetic medicine, moving upstream to earlier biomarkers as a predictor, using natural history cohorts and the like as opposed to long-term um, placeboed controlled trials and using the pitch for the accelerated approval pathway, which um, beleaguered though it has been in the last couple of years, has been a source not only of great science and great therapies, but has saved enormous numbers of lives. And for those who may not you know, believe that, I would ask you to, ponder whether you have a loved one or others that had a cancer, because frankly the cancer and oncology um, advancements come from that, or HIV AIDS, which was transformed from a death sentence to a chronic therapy. So I think there are, there are things we can do, and Sonia raised, raised a good point um, the other day, which is we, we also need to challenge our own paradigm as yep. well. It's not simply our external regulators and think about the ways we can take this science and move it faster to patients that are waiting for it. Good, 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 good stuff, Doug. We could, we could go on all day. We are at time. Thank you all for joining in, in this discussion. Um, next up, we're going to talk about how we innovate in innovation. Um, it's kind of hard to say, even trickier to do, I imagine. So please, let me say, say a big thank you to the panel.